Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co-hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Ventavania. Hey guys, welcome back to the Built to Last podcast. We're very excited to have you guys on board with us. This is our sixth episode. It's been a really fun adventure so far. And we're continuing just to grow this thing for God's glory. Uh, we interviewed Coach Greg Adamson with the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. It was an amazing episode. It would mean a lot if you guys could like us on the social media platforms that we have. And also sharing as well would be super helpful. Um, also, if you guys have time, leave a rating, leave a review. We would love to see how we can improve and get feedback from you guys. Um, but our social media platforms are YouTube. Obviously, we're on iTunes and Spotify. Twitter and Instagram. And then our website, once again, is www.teambuilttolast.com. And when we started this thing, Charlie, I mean, we started this thing to be a community, right? So if you guys have any thoughts on maybe a speaker who you'd want to see on here, or uh, if you'd like to be a, a writer for an article or vice versa, whatever the case may be, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're always trying to grow this thing and make it the best we can, like you were saying, Charlie, for God's glory. And so if you guys have any ideas, feel free to pass them our way. Uh, this week, when we interviewed Coach Adamson, we learned a lot. Uh, get, just to give you guys a little bit of an update on who he is and his background a little bit. Um, he's approaching seven years uh, at University of Tennessee this January. He is the Associate Director of Sports Performance there. And uh, over his time in coaching, he's actually worked with uh, over 23 Division I sports. Uh, he has 12 years of Division I experience. And he's also worked with numerous Olympians, professional athletes, and youth athletes as well. Uh, he is also a member, a uh, fun fact about him, of the Army National Guard. And so while he's working at Tennessee, there will be times when he does serve uh, with our armed forces. And so a uh, great episode here. Hope you guys enjoy it and take a lot from it. And then real quick, guys, just an overview of the episode. We start off with the background in his field, strength conditioning, obviously talking about his training philosophy. We talk about the ships, relationships, ownership, hardship, leadership, championship, and ultimately discipleship through Jesus Christ. We also talked about the work-life balance, how to share Christ, how to fight ego, and then different lessons that Coach Adamson has learned. You guys are in for a great one. Get ready to sit down, take some notes, and build lasting athletes. Let's go. All right, guys, I'm here with uh, Greg Adamson from University of Tennessee this week. Coach, appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, man, appreciate you guys having me, man. Feeling blessed and excited. Awesome. Uh, so we just want to just start off with just asking you a little bit about your background uh, and how you got into strength and conditioning. Yeah, man, great question. So I'm uh, on my 12th year, um, definitely starting to, you know, hit the mid-30s. So it's been an interesting kind of transition as my kids get a little older and you start to grow as a coach. You start to see some things maybe you didn't see before. And I'm blessed to have an amazing staff to work with here. Um, I've worked with 23 different sports. Uh, initially, not a very good athlete, right? Um, just had to consistently learn um, and try and figure out ways to improve. Um, Went to a school, Winthrop University down in South Carolina. I was going to try and walk on, play a little bit. Took advantage of that. Uh, you know, ended up in grad school at Central Michigan as a GA. I uh, was blessed to get an opportunity up there as a coach and just continued to chip away. And I've been at Tennessee about going on seven years now. It's uh, definitely been a wild ride. Um, worked with a lot of really amazing individuals and uh, most importantly, a lot of awesome athletes. And what sports are you working with right now, Coach? Right now, I've got men's and women's swimming and dive, and then men's golf. Um, and then I'm the secondary for women's soccer. So uh, we're pretty blessed and excited to kind of the way we've laid out our performance department here. Uh, but we've set it up to where everybody's got primary and secondaries. You know, I think it's a little rare, maybe sometimes. Yeah, but I think what that does is trying to put full-time coaches working with other sports, you know. So for a good bit, I worked with women's soccer here. We had an unbelievable coaching assistant assistant for us and he's done an amazing job and you know it's one of those things as you grow and you kind of travel more with teams um, I think one of the things I kind of want to push in our profession a little bit is if we're going to talk about all right you know it's not about our ego well do we have the humility to encourage and maybe be his assistant right so he's running soccer this year and he's doing an amazing job with it and I'm his secondary coach and just help out where I can um, but that also allows me to dig deeper I picked up men's golf I hadn't been working with them and so you know, I think that as a department, it allows us to kind of really touch the athletes' lives and different athletes know us all, you know, and so it's pretty cool. Um, obviously, we're blessed to have an administration and a budget that allows that, right? Um, I haven't always been at a school that 
had that ability. I remember being at Winthrop up in teams and, you know, and so it's just exciting in that sense. Yeah, and that's something that I think even when I was an intern and when I was working under other coaches and essentially assistant on, on their staff, I remember just trying to be as bought in as possible so I could take away as much as possible. And even now as a full-time assistant, when I work under sport coaches, I always tell them I'm not the head strength and conditioning coach for women's lacrosse. I'm, I'm an assistant women's lacrosse coach. I'm a part of your staff and whatever your vision is, I'm going to fully embody that. And um, and I've learned a ton that way, um, just from fully buying into whatever coach I'm under. And then for me, I'm able to pick and choose what I want to put into my training philosophy. Um, and so one the question I actually have for you is, what is your training philosophy within your programming? Yeah, man, uh, great question. You know, so I mean, I think from a training perspective, education, empowerment, adaptability, right? We've got to do a good job educating the athletes. Um, we all talk about it's generation Y, I, Y, right? Um, they ask a lot of questions. So, I mean, uh, we have to have education as a staple of what we're doing, right? And then we've got to empower them to make the adaptable decisions. You know, it's funny, I've had this conversation, you know, just this morning with one of our young interns, I was kind of helping out and asking some questions, you know, and one of the things that popped up was squat depth. You know, and if you talked to me about eight to 10 years ago, I'd say everybody goes hamstring parallel, right? And I'd probably told you just so the hamstrings were activated, you know, and the research has probably shown not that, right? Now there's a lot of research and you can almost prove or disprove what you want based off science, right? That's the fun aspect for the people that want to go down that road. But what I have realized is everybody's got a different femur ratio. Everybody's going to get to a different position. So what's the thought process behind the squat, right? Um, if it's for power, you know, and I've had some, we've had some really good athletes come through here and I've had some good coaches talk about, you know, hey, this kid's only going to quarter squat after six weeks, but they're going to go heavy and vice versa, get a hormone release and their quad and glutes going to get activated to an extent. And then you've got people saying, hey, they got to get below parallel. Um, and so, I, I, you know, it's funny, like for me, that education aspect, that's got to be the staple of, okay, what is, you know, and it, it's kind of the trendy term right now, you know, define your why and all that. And, but I do think it's important to have that. Um, but I think you got to have the proper structure, right? Um, you know, I, I think that everybody kind of wants to have a quote unquote system. Um, but, you know, your system is going to be based off of your situation, right? And so it's got to be adaptable, you know, and when I say situation, coach, athlete, um, you know, where they're at in the season, where they're at and what they're trying to accomplish. And so it's so complex, you know, I mean, I get excited, um, but I mean, that's at the heart of what it is. You remember playing EA sports, it's in the game. I tell our kids the EA, you know, it's in the game, right? Education, empowerment, adaptability. Um, I, I do think that as the continuum shifts, the best teachers are going to rise to the top. Uh, their athletes are going to believe in them. Their coaches are going to believe in them. You know, it's it's funny. I was talking with uh, Brett Bartholomew the other day. We were texting, and, uh, you know, I, I struggle a little bit. You know, he does a phenomenal job on social media, and I, I struggle just to share. I don't really get always fully excited about it. I do my best to really help out in recruiting uh, just because I know, you know, these, these athletes that we're recruiting are very, um, you know, they're excitable about that type of information. But, yes, you know, like I told him, I was like, man, this is tough to put this information out because you can't necessarily define the context, right? And so, so many things can be misconstrued over what you're going to put out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and, and so I, in today's day and age, I do have a tough time sometimes talking through them. Like, you got to go down and visit a place. You got to be around the kids. You gotta, um, I, even my 52 week annual plan, like at times, I'm different. So, um, we got to be adaptable ourselves as well, right? And we're fortunate enough to have the information that we maybe used to not have to do a better job of that. Um, but man, isn't it fun, right? Like, you <laughs> best job on the planet. And it's it's a tough question, right? Like, someone might say, "Well, I'm triphasic or I'm tier system or you know conjugate or whatever it might be," and it, it's it's so hard the way I'm wired. You know, I'm like, I just want to be an artist, man. I want to add the right layers at the right time and just never stop painting, right? And, um, I'm enamored by those great artists that could just paint a picture, you know, time and time again. And they just, those little differences, those little nuances made such a big difference. Like, how do you figure out what those might be? You can figure out what that is with each kid and help them be better. You know? I, I love that. And we talk about it in our office all the time that, again, the program we're giving the athlete, the X's and O's, that program's only as effective as what they put into it, right? So, or, and it also essentially how I deliver it, right? And so, um, 
and even tied in with that and just our, our brief interactions before we got on the, uh, on the Zoom call here, I know you had talked to me a little bit about your philosophy outside of just your programming with the, um, the Love Tough. And uh, yeah. if you don't mind going into that a little bit, I'd love to hear yeah. more about that. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I mean, I think oftentimes we always talk about tough love, right? And, you know, I think if you reverse those words, um, you get a really powerful uh, idea and, you know, you can really make it a belief, you know? So I tell our kids, you know, we're going to love tough. So I'm going to love you in a way that's going to create these tough standards, you know? And, and so everything's done out of love, you know? But when you make love the first thing, you can then actually, in my opinion, have a tougher standard, right? Um, you know, and it's funny, these kids are blessed, but they struggle, right? They struggle mentally. They struggle emotionally, right? I mean, I, you talk to any strength coach in America, men or women, I guarantee you, we don't go cycle without a kid coming in the weight room and crying, right? Whether it's injury, boyfriend, girlfriend, sickness, family, at some point in the next year, I'm going to have an athlete who's had a family member pass away. You don't tell me that doesn't impact what's about to happen, you know, not just in that workout, but for the next 10 to 15, right? Um, and so we've got to love them, right? And through that love, we can create that toughness. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know and, I, and I'll say the other thing, too, is for me is I go about, and I don't know if I alluded to this, but um, I, I, it's all about the ships. And so it's about relationships first. That's the first ship. You know, it's relational. You've got to get to know them. you got to know their name. You know, I, I saw someone say it one day out on Twitter before you worry about the technique, know their name to correct their technique, right? Um, you just got to know them, right? you got to build a great relationship. Through relationship, you can create ownership. So they've got to own the training, right? They've got to own what you're doing, you know, and they realize that that's hard. That's hardship, you know, and through hardship, you have leadership and championship. And um, before being at Tennessee, man, I, I had never been through four years with a team. You know, you could walk in right now and you would tell which kids are seniors and which kids are freshmen just based off of the ships, um, where they're at in ownership, where they're at with their hardship, their leadership. And, you know, as we try and create this championship culture, um, you know, and it's, it's funny, like you get, I look at that and oftentimes, you know, just even thinking about this, this uh, call, I was like, man, I need to add discipleship, right? <laughs> discipleship <laughs> and your leadership, yeah. right? You know, and so um, I definitely got to make sure that gets in there because I think biblically, that's what Jesus did, right? He came down to earth, man, he, he showed up and he built great relationships with these guys, right? But then he taught them how to own it, right? Whether it was Peter, John, Matthew, I mean, depending on who you look at, there was ownership involved, and that was hard. You know, I think Peter's a great example of how hard it was to really own all that. But once he conquered it, right, look at that leadership and discipleship falling into place. Mm -hmm. Now he's got a championship culture, right, championship. You know, at the time, right, it was the, it was the young church, you know. But um, I do think that the love tough is, I mean, God loves us, right? That's tough. <laughs> it's tough on him, no doubt. You know, being a parent, I got two kids, and, Probably one of the hardest things you'll ever do is love somebody and help kind of them through that path, and and, and so it's tough both ways, right? So, uh, you know, let's go ahead. Well, no, that's incredible that you're saying that because, um, I mean, I was just reading John 15 today, and he talks about, uh, you know, Jesus laying down his life. That's an example of what true love is: is laying down your life for your friends. And so, us as coaches, we're to lay down our lives, you know, for the athletes that we are serving, and then you can by by demonstrating that you're teaching them how to love each other. So I love coach what you're saying about your foundation is about love. Um, and then also too, with going back to what you were saying with the education, the empowerment and the adaptability, it's very similar words that I use. I use educate, motivate, empower, but same kind of concept, learning their wife, teaching them, and then ultimately letting them be empowered um, with leadership and the championship. So that's awesome. But um, I wanted to kind of ask you another question. You're at University of Tennessee. It's a non-faith-based environment. What are the things that you find most challenging sharing your faith as a Christian strength coach in that environment? How do you creatively do that uh, where you're not kind of shoving it down their throat or, you know, being impolitically correct or whatever, incorrect? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things you spend any time with me, I really don't worry about uh, politically correct. <laughs> you know, right, wrong, and different. Um, you know, I, so that's part of it, right? Um you know, I'm definitely going to speak from the heart, um, you know, and then, I mean, I'm incredibly blessed, you know, our athletes, you know, we've got an unbelievable athletes in action, FCA, they call it one Tennessee. So it's pretty cool. Um, you know, I've been at some schools and some places where they don't, you know, the campus ministries don't usually work together like that, but man, our chaplains, they're in here working out, right. We've got a great relationship with them. 
Um, I'll get lunch with them. They hold me accountable. Um, you know, we've got just, you know, and, and it's tough, right? You know, we've got a little book club that we've got going on, but then we've also got these different t- team Bible studies. You know, I'd say, though, it's changed a lot as, I, as my kids have gotten older, you know. Uh, when I first got into coaching, you know, I remember being at every FCA meeting. I remember being there with the athletes. Um, when I was at Winthrop, I remember us getting the first uh, full-time person there. Um, she was a former soccer player. I loved her and her husband, you know, and it was really cool to watch them. And he's a doctor now, but you see him go on. But when I got here, we, my son was born and he's six now. My daughter's three. You know, one of the things I struggle with is obviously if I'm in the weight room at 530 in the morning, which is probably four days a week, you know, five, five thirty, whatever. If I leave at six, I'm not coming back for a 745 athletes in action meeting. Right. Like that's not me leading my family and leading by example of what that looks like. So it's definitely been a little bit of an entry. You know, it's, it's been a process of where how do you get to know the team leaders? Right. And. How do you encourage them and hope that they make an impact? Uh, but then it's also having some tough conversations, you know. Um, but, yeah, man, in, those, in that regard, uh, I mean, if you get an email from me, it says Psalm 37.4 on there. I've always had it. I don't really hide from it. Um, you know, I don't really force it down anybody. But it's also one of those things where, you know, it's pretty cool. We had an assistant uh, accept Christ and get baptized. Wow. Wow. You know, you know, we, we brought the church in. They did a really cool video on him and his story and, you know, growing up with, uh, without his dad necessarily and where he's at now. And, um, yeah, man, we, we let him in the weight room. They got video of him coaching, me and him coaching together, right? I don't know. Like, I guess maybe I can or cannot do that. I, I don't know. At some point, maybe when someone's going to politely say don't do that. But, uh, you know, I've been blessed that that hasn't happened yet. Um, but I'm also at a point, it's funny you know, when everybody looks at jobs and, and as you're progressing through life in this profession, I think one of the things you initially look at is money, right? And then you look at what's the title. And I was, I was right in that boat, especially four to five years ago. Um, now, you know, I, I look at <laughs> what's the coaching staff like? Um, are they going to allow me to be me, right? Are they going to allow me to be unfiltered and be who I am and be the coach that you know, I desire to be, I think I'll allow me to have the impact on the athletes' lives that um, I want to be around and have. And, and if the answer is no, that's okay. You know, and I think it can be easy to get, you know, I, I, it's funny, like everybody, I don't know if it's necessarily chasing the logo. I think it's chasing worth, right? Like we define our worth sometimes by how the world would allow it. But, uh, you know, if we're chasing hearts, <laughs> at some point, God's going to make sure those doors that need to be open are open, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, but it can be easy to forget to chase hearts. You know, I'm just as guilty. And I think at times when maybe I wasn't making the salary I wanted to make and I'm working 70 hours a week, you know, it's, it's tough to sit there and think, all right, am I chasing hearts today? Right. Did I, did I go out and do that? Or, you know, and, and that's where having, you know, there's a group of men that, you know, I, we do our studies together. I know you guys, coach Woodfin, Zach, man, he's unbelievable. And coach Finley, um, there's a few guys, man, we do this, uh, daily little uh, Bible study. And it's been incredibly encouraging for me just because we have that accountability because you don't always get plugged in like you'd like at a church. You know I mean? We got a men's group at my church and I don't know about you guys, but they think 645 is early. I'm like, Hey, can we meet at like four? You know, I'll make it. <laughs> you know, I can't be there at 645. I'm two hours into work, you know? Um, but yeah, man, I, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe that's, you know, I'm, I'm in a good place, you know, Tennessee, it's all about being a volunteer. So, you know, Maybe it's a little bit better, uh, but it's all I've kind of ever known as well. So, you know, I, I hope it never gets to a place that, it keep, you know, you can't necessarily have that public faith, you know. Um, you never know, though. And I liked a lot of the things you said there, Coach. One thing that I think keeps coming up is the discipleship, the leadership piece. And uh, I know it's tough. Obviously, I'm sure you want you want to go to the FCA and Athletes in Action uh, huddles. It's got to be tough, though, because, again, it's time-wise, it's hard. Uh-huh. It's incredibly hard, man. And I, but I will say this. You get to know the captains, right, and your teams and the kids that are going to truly make an impact. You know, our men's swim captain last year is now working for them, right? And, you know, I've been blessed to just spend a lot of time with him. And so your ability to maybe have more of a one-on-one relationship is definitely at a little bit of a higher value, but you got to be more intentional about when it's going to happen, you know, and getting out to lunch with these guys. And I think lunch is incredible, um, you know, and, and – and just kind of seeking those moments and letting them in your office. Cause 
uh, it's the only way you're going to necessarily kind of make that happen. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's, and it's, I think your discipleship changes a little bit. I, I would say now I'm more intentional with time with assistant coaches mm. you know, or associate head coaches or head coaches. Mm. But, you know, I, I, I used to not necessarily maybe seek that out and, you know, they got to be encouraged and I got to be encouraged and we're in similar spots, you know? And so that, that's important too, I think. And you're talking about sport coaches or other strength and conditioning I'll coaches? Sport coaches and strength coaches, right? Either way. Yeah. yeah. Both, you know, I mean, but I've got, you know, our associate head men's swim coach, uh, similar spots in life. He's a little bit older, but, uh, you know, we'll go get lunch every now and then and we'll take training off the table, right? We'll take where we're at as a team off the table and just check in on how our wives do and both our wives work. His wife's a pharmacist, my wife's a dietitian. So they work kind of in hospital settings type jobs and we've each got kids. It's like, how are we balancing that? Where are we at in our faith? Um, do we need to get outside and go get a hike, get away, right? Because it can be, you know, sports can be, you know, there's there's a side of it where as a coach, when it doesn't go the way we thought it should have went, it can be pretty difficult, especially in the moment. And to sit there and not talk about that or to act as if we don't need encouragement, um, we're playing right in, I think, in the Satan's hands. Well, Coach, I mean, I think it's safe to say that I think you're making a huge impact, whether or not you're at the, the, the Bible studies late at night, because it sounds like the way you're living your life on a daily basis uh, speaks louder, you know, than, you know, just a one time a week for an hour, you know, on a Monday night or whenever it is. Um, and making disciples and building leaders is something I think that all of us as coaches are trying to do in one way or another, whether or not you're coming from a faith perspective. Um, for you, what, what makes a great leader uh, and what are some of the best leaders that you've been around? Yeah, man. So, yeah, I put together a little little piece for this. Raw okay. passion, right? Raw passion. Um, do it like your life depends on it. I think, uh, you know, obviously a great leader means going hard, leaving it all out there. We always talk about it and giving it everything you've got. Um, but it's not about making a living. It's about making a life. So the best leaders I've been around, you know, and our head swim coach cracks me up all the time. He's like, man, you know, coaches, if you're, if you're in this for the money, you're in, <laughs> you need to stop it. You know, um, and so if you're going after the pack, you know, the paycheck, you're never going to fully be fulfilled. But if you go after the passions God's put on your heart, um, you go all in and that raw passion is going to, you know, allow it to, uh, you know, that energy. Um, it's going to definitely motivate yourself, but it's going to motivate more importantly those around you. That infectious enthusiasm. You know, so I think the best leaders I've been around um, consistently enthusiastic. Right. They're overflowing. And so there's something different. Um, but I think, uh, obviously, you got to be careful. Um, but I'd say the other thing, too, is the best leaders I've been around, you're constantly challenging yourself, you know, getting in uncomfortable situations. Um, I think in coaching, getting outside your comfort zone can be difficult, you know, um, whether it's physically, spiritually, relationally, um, you know, and, and it's it's easier said than done. Um, you know, this, this past year, so I'm in the Air National Guard. I was out in Lackland Air Force Base for nine weeks, and I did basic training. I'm 34 now, but I was 33 at the time, right? So a little older than a lot of the guys, 18 to 20 year old. But that meant as a coach, I was leaving my teams for nine weeks. No cell phone. You know, I got three calls for 15 total minutes while I'm there, and those three calls are going to be to my wife and kids, right? And hopefully I can catch my kids. They're probably going to be asleep. Um, you know, so that was interesting for me as a coach, and you talk about – how do you, you know, the best leaders that you've been around, how do you handle that uncomfortability? I mean, I had someone else running the program, but I'm also big on fluid programs. So I got to give them, I got to give them a little bit of rain to change the program as we go. Right. Um, you know, and then when I get back, what does it look like? How do I become a coach again? How do I get back in this situation? Knowing that a, in a couple of years, I'll probably be gone again. Right. How do my coaches handle that? How do my athletes handle that? And I think what happens is the best leaders I've been around are just that, that raw passion is in the now. Right. Um, and I, you know, that's kind of, I look at Christ and that is kind of how I, I feel like he lived, you know, um, you know, and, and he was fully alive, you know, but it, in that work, at, you know, Colossians 3.23, work willing at, willingly at whatever you do as though if you're working for the Lord um, rather than for people. But I think when I think about that verse and we think about what we do as leaders is um, if we're really doing it for God, then he's saying, hey, don't worry about two years from now. Don't worry about even tomorrow. Just worry about where you're right at right now. Um, you know, so I think that's important. Um, and I think you got to have, you know, the best leaders I've been around know it's not about them, right? Um, you're going to serve, right? And what does serving look like? Man, it's hard. It is so hard. Um, especially at times where you feel like 
maybe it doesn't make sense, you know, um, especially on paper or in the situation you're in. You know, but you gotta, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know about you guys, but when I read about when Christ was walking around, he seems like he was a pretty fun guy to be around, right? Like, <laughs> there was some crowds following him around. He had some enthusiasm. He was never like, hey, you know, I don't know if we're going to catch fish today. You know, it was like, man, watch and see how much fish you catch, you right. know? So, um, it's the same thing with our athletes, you know? They're going through a lot. Um, you know, I've been coaching long enough to know you're not going to win the championship every season, right? That doesn't mean you don't want to. I'm as competitive as they come. I, I, I hate losing. But, you know, I've got to have that, that passion and enthusiasm for something a little bit bigger than that, um, you know, to make sure that that's going to be what's overflowing, you know? Um, but your cup's got to be filled too, man. And I, I tell you guys, um, about the midway point in my career, I didn't do a good job of that. Um, and I'm blessed that God put some certain people in my life and some certain mentors, and they kind of showed me here's how that grows and here's what that looks like, you know, because otherwise you're just going to be, you're going to be, uh, you know, I don't know if the press is the word, but you're going to be frustrated, right? Just slightly, just nothing's going to seem as if it's clicking, you know? Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's so true because, you know, our job is to be a servant. And so if we're not being filled, we're like a, that water bottle, you know, if we're not being filled, we're just pouring out. We're just, we're not going to have anything left to give. And like the, you know, uh, the verse that you were talking about, Colossians 3.23, and then you said not worrying about tomorrow, the verse that I think of is uh, when Jesus is talking about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6.33 and 34, and he says, hey, don't worry about all those things. He says, seek my kingdom first and my righteousness, um, and I'll take care of the rest pretty much. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trials of its own. Um, and, Coach, I love, to what you're saying about the raw passion. And the cool thing about that is, Okay, well, there's lots of people that are passionate, but what separates us being Christians? Well, we get our passion and energy most of all from the love of God, from uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. You look at the fruit of the Spirit. Nehemiah 18 talks about, uh, 810 talks about the joy of the Lord is your strength. So, how do you balance um, this raw passion and, you know, making it, uh, making it not about you because ego is so prevalent in our culture, especially being at a higher level, you know, university. I mean, Tennessee, that's a big, big time university. How do you balance staying grounded in that humility? My wife, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, she's, she's a big part of it, right? Like she has compassion. So I say she completes us. No, I mean, I think, uh, I think the reality of knowing that uh, at any moment it can be gone, right? You know, I worked with football here for a couple of years. Uh, all those guys, unfortunately, are no longer here, right? So you see the reality of uh, you see people lose jobs, um, you see people move on, um, you see people get a little maybe burnt out in the profession, right? Um, I, I think so. Having that understanding of it, um, you know, and then I think, man, it, it, yes, you're at the University of Tennessee, you know, but I, I don't know. Maybe you know the hard part for me is. You know, where I'm blessed is like, for example, this weekend I've got drills. So I'm going to go up to Michigan. We have a swim meet Thursday, Friday. I'm going to fly back Friday night at 6 a.m. when we'll be on base. At 6 a.m., I'm going to help with our um, PT testing and whatnot. And then I'm going to be in services. So I'm going to be helping food prep, right? So, like, pretty cool job. But I've got, you know, part of you could say, okay, you've got a master's degree. What are you doing as an enlisted A1C helping with food prep this weekend, right? I would look at you and say, what an awesome opportunity to hang out with some unbelievable men and women who, uh, you know, help protect us and prepare stuff. And, you know, it's a place to learn. Right. But I think it, you know, oftentimes we, we, we see learning as if, uh, you know, we, we want to learn for the test and we forget what the test really is, if that makes sense. Another thing I will say, getting back to passion. Um, I don't know if people really thought about this, but it's kind of been on my heart lately. It was no coincidence that the final week of Christ's life is passion. Week. It's phenomenal. You know, it's, that's what it's about. And, and so I will say this is that passion from him is going to, that's what he's going to get it from, you know. Um, the other thing, too, is you got to have right people. You know, our, you know, Tag, one of our athletes in action, he'll sit me down at lunch. He'll ask me hard questions. He'll ask me, um, <laughs> you get in the word, bro. You know, those are his exact words. Um, you know, so you got to make sure you seek the right people to kind of speak into your life um, and not be afraid to kind of, and then you got to seek moments to go fill your cup back up, you know, like, this past Sunday, you know, it was obviously a long week. You may or may not want to go to church, but you got to get up and lead your family. And you got to get to church, you know, and then see what God, you know, what, what God might have for you there. Um, and I think that's the tough part is, is, um, but, you know, like I said, it's, it's tough. 
you know, like to answer that though. And then, I mean, from an ego standpoint, man, when I first got to this league, I got, I mean, there's some of the teams I worked with, man, we got beat all the time, right? So that was really good for me because when I was at Central Michigan as a GA, we won a lot. Our women's soccer, unprecedented success. Wrestling was good. Gymnastics was good. Football was good. Like, uh, and that can be dangerous, right? I got to Winthrop, uh, had some success with some teams. But it's funny, I had a baseball team my first year. I worked with them. Um, dude, our, our guys were yoked. They were bought in. I think we went 1-12 to open the season up, right? And I'm, like, sitting here. Like, it's probably one of my best years as a strength coach. You know, a couple of those guys are still – bouncing around in AAA, AA, and it was just an amazing group of men. But, man, we couldn't – we just couldn't consistently hit, right? And I love that. I love that baseball coach, and he's still there, and he's done a phenomenal job. It just wasn't a very good year on the field. And I think that taught me a lot at the time. Oh, wow. You know, like, you could be the best strength coach, and it, it may not click, right? And then, you know, you look at it, and you start to grow, like ACLs, right? I went six years working with women's soccer, women's basketball at Central Michigan – Went through, been here, and no ACLs. And all of a sudden, man, I had like, I had one year, my three best kids were out by the second game, you know, and and, 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 it, and it humbles you a little bit, right? And you start really looking at it. Here you are thinking you have everything figured out, and you start to realize there's so many variables. And so, you know, I, I tell our staff all the time, um, you just got to be really careful with uh, what you say and how you go about saying things, but uh, never speak in absolutes, right? The only absolute is Christ. Um, because you could say, hey, it's once you go down that route, you're, you're, you're now basically putting yourself ahead, right? And in an ego bit, you know, at times ego can help, you know, but there's a fine line between ego and narcissism, right? And if you cross over, like, that can be difficult because now you're saying this athlete wouldn't have had success unless you were there, right? Well, you don't know that. So that's, that's an interesting thing to say because you can't necessarily theoretically prove that, right? So... Um, you can get into some conversations with coaches about that sometimes about, but then you got to have that same conversation with yourself. Right. Um, and that's where it's, what's it really about? And that's why it always comes back to me about the person, right? Like that relationship. Um, that's where the true success is going to be found because that's where your true meaning of impact is going to be found. And I couldn't agree more coach. I mean, I can't, you know, tell you how many times a team has, had a great season and I'd like to say that I'm the most humble person in the world you know our part of our family core values is humility um, but it's not always easy to be humble when you see success in the field sometimes we like to take credit and when things aren't going so well you at times want to blame other things and you know as leaders we have to I think constantly check ourselves to make sure that we are taking ownership when we can correct things and when things go great not being so quick to think that it was you know all because of you like you're saying oh and I'll tell you too like when I you know so I, my first year working with swim, we were 22nd and 20th in the country. And I'm all like hyped up, right? Like I'm getting my first bonus I've ever gotten. I'm like, what's this, a bonus for end of the year rankings? I didn't know what that was, you know? And my head swim coach is like, that'll never happen again. And he was pissed, right? And he's frustrated. And like, next thing I know, I realized like his expectation is we need to be a, consistently a top 10 program, which we are right now on the women's side. And, you know, it, it was just interesting to me that, you talk about humility, that's pretty humbling. Here I am thinking, oh, man, we're top 25 in the country. And he's looking at it like, man, we have the ability and the resources. There's no reason we shouldn't be top 10. You know, we yeah. have, you know and so it, it's all about how it is, you know, and, and it's tough, right? Like you got to sell success to keep, get your kids believing necessarily in it. Uh, you know, and this, this whole recruiting thing, man, it's a weird it's, – it's a weird – it's got our profession in a weird place right now too, Right. You got sport coaches making decisions on whether or not you can communicate and talk to recruits, right? That's important. Whether or not they see themselves necessarily maybe wanting to go to school there, et cetera. Um, but if we're being honest, like, we're not all starting in the same place, you know? And so we've got to be careful with uh, how we compare ourselves to one another, you know? And um, it's funny, you know, I, a good example of, like, you talk about growth is four or five years ago, you know, I, I took my team to the beach and we absolutely hammered them on a training trip and it was pretty fun. And my men's team, I gave them a little pet, pep talk and, you know, basically, you know, the theme, get to a theme. I'm like, at the end, we're going to break it down. I want you guys just going nuts. I want people hearing us in Gainesville. I want people hearing us in Athens. I want people in the hotel asking, right, you know, a little SEC, how, how excited are you? And they picked two words, hard work. They're not the we're definitely not going to win the IQ award of intelligent wordplay, right? I loved it, hard work. We kept it simple. 
But four or five years ago, I stayed in the middle as they started chanting and just losing their minds. You know, at this point now, you know, and, and my kids have been really good for this, is I kind of just faded, right? So once they're going crazy, now I'm kind of out of the background. Um, that's been tough for me to learn how to do. It's a lot more fun sometimes just to stay in the middle of the circle and stay hyped up, right? But if I can't teach them to bring their own energy and juice and enthusiasm in that type of setting, am I allowing them to know how to do it when they really need it the most, when they're by themselves on the blocks and there's no one there? And so they've had to, you know, go to that place of internal perspective. And so I, it, it's, it's definitely like, you know, it's an intriguing process. Um, you know, I'd say Zach's been a huge mentor of mine. My boss here, our director, Dan Worth, you know, like, I'll slide this in real quick. You know, a couple of years ago, I thought I was going to be the director here, you know, and uh, interviewed for it. And we ended up hiring Dan. And at the time, I was like, man, that's tough. You know, like, do I need to leave, et cetera? And he's been an unbelievable mentor to me here. And uh, he's 54 years old. And, been a, he, you know, he was out of it for 16 years. And he was a director of Arizona before that. And uh, it's taught me a lot about who am I really, right? Like, why did I, why am I wanting to be a director or am I wanting to make an impact? You know, am I wanting to be able to raise my family in a community that we feel really blessed to do that in? Or am I wanting to go around and, you know, get caught up in some of the other things that it can be easy to get caught up in this profession? You know, it's it's a weird profession right now, you know, with the Instagram. Like, I, and I, I try and keep up. I just can't, you know. <laughs> I don't know how you guys, like, there's certain coaches out. I'm like, man, how you guys do all these awesome videos, man? Shoot, like, I want to be right there with you, you know. Um but, I, you know, I think everybody's got different gifts. And that's the other thing I realize in our profession is we all do things a little bit differently, but we all do them well in our own way. So where is that, right? Just because someone doesn't do it the way you think they do, um, that might not be where they make that a priority, you know. And you got to be careful to get caught up in that game. But yeah, man, it's uh, no doubt. And I love that story, Coach. If we can go back for a second that yeah. you told about being right in the middle of the circle, you're the hype man, getting everybody fired up, and then they're hooting and hollering and this option to stay there or kind of fade into the background a little yeah. bit. Um, like we were saying earlier, again, it's not, we can't always take credit for every win or every loss. Right. Uh, but what we can have control over, right. Is the culture in our weight room. Right. And I think we can directly impact the culture of a team. And so, and I think things that you're doing like that, again, making them more self-sufficient and having them take ownership, talk about the ships um, of their energy and things like that. I think that's awesome. What do you do? Um, is there anything like specifically that you use to create culture in your weight room? Or and what does your c culture kind of look like? Man, culture. First, that's, you know, like a cool word. Big Everybody's word right now. Oh, yeah. yeah you know? <laughs> uh, anybody that ever comes to visit, man, they say your athletes are always having fun, man. So I've been competition. Right. Everything's about competition. You know, we've uh, you know, I'm going to let a little secret out. So I don't I'm hopefully not. I want a ton of people to watch it and listen for your all sake. But maybe not, you know, uh, <laughs> spike ball. Right. Like spike ball. I think spike ball has been absolutely huge. We got four courts. Um, any given moment we got games going on. Um, man, always looking to compete, whether it's assault bikes facing each other with the foam roll dropped in the middle, um, whether it's a jump, whether I, I don't care what it is. Um, you know, I think these kids got to, they, they love to compete. They love to have fun to sit here and think that, you know, a men's golfer or a female swimmer or diver wakes up in the morning worried about like undulating periodization, you know, man, when, when the coach put that wave in, I think I could have got like, you know, maybe five more pounds or even, you know, my, maybe my foreign kids or our traditionalists like kilos, right? Like they don't think like majority are not going through that. Right. But if I get them, if I get them playing a little bit of spike ball, you know, and I get them moving around a little bit, and there's that enthusiasm, there's that competition, um, it's going to be a great day, you know, because it, I think, I think learning to compete is a little bit of a lost art form, but I also think learning to communicate within competition is a definite lost art form, um, you know. And so the other thing too is the the culture wise, the ownership piece. I challenge that a lot. Um, I challenge them to kind of think about themselves in that light and. But, you know, that really is hard. It's hard to, it's hard on them and it's hard on me. You know, I, I five years ago, 10 years ago, I'd have told, tell a kid, hey, go do this. And that's why, because I said so, you know. Now I'm finding myself like, what do you think about that? Or how come you haven't done that yet? Or do I have enough confidence to allow them to not do it for a sec so I can then go back and correct it? Right? <laughs> Easier said than done. And um, like I said, I, I think that kind of calmness, is kind of 
what I'm trying to strive to have. But I think those things are important, man. Uh, but I, <laughs> you can't walk into a collegiate. Right. Be, everybody's got to be feeling that, you know. And at any given moment, you know, our, our motto is anyone, anywhere, any, any time, bar none, you know, and AAA bar none. And that's that's got to be lived and thought about. You know, we had a little spike ball competition, and I, myself and one of our assistant coaches won it against the team. Now I split the team up. I don't need no super teams. They're 18 to 22. I got to split them up a little bit, make it a little even, right? Our average age was 37. So, um, but we we played probably who we thought in the semifinals of the bracket the better team. We felt if we won that game, we'd win it all. And uh, they didn't want to play on our – we have got one spike ball that's a little broken. You know, our, our courts are taking a little beating. It's taped up, and they didn't want to play on it. The second they didn't want to play on it, that's the only one we were playing on, right? Like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but about an hour later, after they they, they calmed down and we had won it, you know, you go sit down with, the, with those guys and you have the conversation of, like, look, man, like, what are you going to do when – whether it's the squat rack, right – or the pool or et cetera, isn't exactly how you thought it should be that day. What, what kind of decisions are you going to make internally, right? And so I think that competition is important that we live it with them and they see us competing as well and they see us pushing ourselves. That's huge, you know? I mean, that's awesome, Coach. Um, the competition is definitely, a, you know, a lost art. And it just as an encouragement to me, man, am I, am I getting too focused on, you know, the X's and the O's and not making it fun? Because uh, I've been told this before, the athletes didn't come there to lift weights, they came there, you know, to play their sport. So if we can make it a fun environment, they're going to get way more out of the training. Um, yeah, it, it, and it's tough, too, depending on where you're at, right? Like, um, man, when you got some Ferraris and Lamborghinis, like I do, I got some kids that are just incredibly freaks. Um, I got to be careful with them, but I got I to gotta get them engaged, you know, because they're looking at you like I got here without this, you know, and they didn't come to school to learn science. <laughs> You know, and so it's like, how do I, how do I bridge that gap? You know, and so that can be tough. You know, I, it, it, it's a, it's a weird, it, it's definitely a weird dynamic too of where we're at, where they can get on Instagram and they'll show you what so and so's doing, or they're watching it. You know, it's, it's always funny to me, like how, how keen they are on everything that's going on around them. You know, but no, it's taken me a while to learn that, man. It, it, no. I, I did not always have the efficacy. No, that's awesome, Coach. This is this episode has been a wealth of knowledge, and for all our listeners out there, we we do give you guys uh, show notes that we type up for you. If you're not able to take the time and, and take show notes for yourself, if you go to our website www.teambuilttolast.com uh, and sign up for our newsletter, you guys will get every month the show notes for the episodes. Uh, but I'm taking a ton of notes here. We took a ton away from the episode, Coach. One last question that we ask all our guests. Um, what, are, what is your favorite book you've ever read? Um, also, favorite verse or story from the Bible? And last one, how do you define success? So however you want awesome. to break those up. Love it, man. Favorite book, uh, Wild at Heart. Love Wild at Heart. Um, awesome book. It means a lot to me. Uh, favorite verse, Psalm 37.4. Relax yourself in the Lord. Give you the desires of your heart. Thinking, coaching. Um, you know, that's probably one of the biggest things we can do. I got kids walking in now. I love it. Um, but if we delight ourselves in the Lord, um, you know, Sean Alexander played high school football at Boone County. It was a rival of ours, and uh, he's, he's much older. But, you know, I remember him saying that, and that's kind of when I first started thinking about Jesus. But when we delight ourselves in the Lord, our desires change, right? Mm -hmm. I tell, you know, anybody that's looking at, you know, thinking about Jesus or I'm sitting there talking with him, I'm like, you know, if you really put your desires in him, uh, you delight yourself in him, those desires will change. You know, so Psalm 37, 4, can't get away from it just because even right now, if I delight myself in him tonight, my house may be dirty or something may not be going, but you know, if I delight myself in him, my desires might be to spend time with my kids and we'll figure out the, the dishes in a little bit. And I'm not saying don't do dishes. I need to, you know, I don't want my wife to be mad, you know, if she's watching this while doing bags, but you know what I'm saying? Um, now how you define success? You know, I'd, I'd like to say that I have that definition, but I think that's, uh, that's one of those questions that we're all searching for. Right. And, I guess the definition, you know, like, I, I don't know if you can define it, right? Because the word success means something to so many different people. Um, you know, I, I would say, though, at the end of the day, you've got to make sure you've got a relationship with Jesus Christ because you're going to meet your maker at some point, right? And so I'm going to define success the day I get to heaven, right? And I think that's when that definition will make more, more sense to me. Um, I know that's probably a little bit different, um, but, you know, I, I think that 
that that's a tough word because once you say this is how I'm going to define what is what is and isn't success, you're basically saying that there's going to be a point where it's like winning or losing, you know. Um, but if we're talking about our lives, like at the end of the day, it's whether or not we've accepted that relationship, right? Um, and so that's a, I don't know, man. I know that wasn't necessarily maybe the cookie cutter, but that's that's from the heart right there, you know. And I, I I'm, I, you know, and I think who said it? Maybe uh, if you say real talk, I won't trust you. Maybe that was Outcast, right? You know, <laughs> don't put at me with uh, this is how we're going to define success. I kind of take a step back and think necessarily how are they maybe getting there, right? You know, because. It's one of those things, it sounds really good to say, hey, we're, you know, a successful season is top 25 or successful season is a championship. But, you know, there's so many things going into uh, what's happening and what's going to happen that, that that's where it's like, how do you deny that there's a God, right? Like, I don't even know how you can say there isn't because there has to be, you know. Yeah. So you define success by living for him and one day meeting him, right? You know, when you get up there. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree best, more. That's the best thing, too, because at the end of the day, that's what life is about. It's about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then, you know, living this life to love your neighbor as yourself. And so I love that definition. That's super unique. And, and Coach, I love, too, your, um, the verse you said, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I, too, have been drawn to that verse the past few years and related it to coaching because it's so oh. true. If we look at our true, deep desires – well, truly, we, we want a relationship with God. Like, we're created to be in a relationship with him, and he will give us more of that if we're seeking that out. And then you'll find that it it overflows into your relationships with your athletes and, you know, your family and that kind of stuff. So I love that Bible verse, man. Very encouraging. And hey, thank you guys for doing this, man. This is awesome. You guys rock, man. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I know Zach. I mean, we started, the, you know, he started, him and Anthony Lamont started the Power Conference, and that's been pretty cool, but. This is phenomenal, man. I mean, it's a lot of work on your guys' part, man. So thank you for taking your time to kind of fill, help people fill up their cups, man. Because it's making a difference, you know. And it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm kind of pumped up too. And you did a good job defining <laughs> success, man. You need to write a dictionary. <laughs> no, I appreciate you. Definitely was looking forward to you know you're just a guy that from from Coach Woodfin he recommended to to reach out to you, and I just you know very thankful that we got to connect and. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to more conversations in the future. Yeah, man. Come visit Knoxville anytime, man. They don't call it Knox Vegas for no reason, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's an unbelievable awesome. place. You know, I'll recruit you, you know, tell you everything we got, man. We got garage <laughs> door Come on. I'm yeah. Sorry. I'm going to take kidding. you up on that, Coach. No, I appreciate the invite and Coach. Yeah. I appreciate the kind yeah. words. Again, this show isn't what it is without people like yourself coming on. And uh, and so we thank you truly for, uh, for doing everything you did today and sharing all that you shared. Appreciate it, guys, man. Have a blessed day. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.